Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to our workshop on gender equality, challenges ahead, from she session to she recovery. This is a workshop of the AXA Research Lab on Gender Equality at Bocconi University, and I am the director of the lab. So thank you for being here with us this afternoon. I will ask uh, Director Don Mario Verona to uh, make the introduction. Thank you. So good afternoon to all of you. It is a distinct pleasure to kickstart the event today because it is the event that officially opens our AXA Research Lab on Gender Equality uh, that in fact already worked pretty hard in the last year uh, because it has already produced some important uh, uh, facts and figures that will be shared even today uh, in uh, uh, the next presentations. But uh, this is the first uh, official kickoff. Uh, it is, uh, as we all know, a very complicated moment and uh, uh, we really hope that uh, will terminate soon. We are coming out from a very complicated moment related to the pandemic crisis, and finally we can host events uh, physically, which is the reason why we postponed the launch of this event. And this event, uh, more specifically, is run like uh, most of the events uh, in these days uh, in a hybrid format. So let me not only uh, uh, greet all of you here uh, in presence, but also all the people that are connected uh, online uh, and uh, I'm sure are looking forward to uh, listening the words of wisdom of the panelists of this afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, remark one important thing for Bocconi University. Uh, uh, first of all, the fact that we are discussing a topic which is central in uh, today's society. Uh, we are very proud to do that with one of our uh, most important partners, strategic partners, that has been collaborating with Bocconi University since 2011, uh, and that is AXA. We are extremely grateful uh, to uh, AXA for uh, giving us the opportunity to fund important basic research on uh, different themes and with respect to this specific lab uh, on the topic of gender equality. And uh, we are even more grateful for the fact that we are trying to divulgate uh, uh, the words uh, uh, on this uh, central theme, which uh, needs to have, uh, again, a stronger presence uh, within corporations and in general within, within within society. Uh, I'm also particularly pleased to, uh, of course, have uh, the opportunity to, to have one of the uh, brightest professor of Bocconi University that will direct the lab, uh, Paola Profeta, that uh, briefly introduced before my speech uh, the, uh, the meeting. Uh, Paola is a professor at Bocconi University that is very well known also in the, in the media coverage because she has been working on this team for many years and she's one of the leaders in European uh, uh, scholars that has published important uh, topics uh, on this uh, on this theme of gender equality, and uh, uh, and so it's great that uh, her with the team that uh, she has identified will uh, in the uh, years to come continue contributing uh, with uh, again a dedicated effort also from the side uh, of AXA. So let me uh, conclude by thanking uh, a series of persons that uh, made this possible. Let me first. Of of all, uh, wholeheartedly thank uh, uh, Giacomo Gigantello, uh, CEO of AXA, that is the one that helped us uh, finalizing this important uh, innovation. Let me thank uh, Antimo Perretta, CEO of AXA Europe and Latin America, that is connected uh, online. A special thank also to, to all the guests and the panelists that will be introduced later on by the next uh, speakers and specifically by Paola Profeta, but let me wholeheartedly thank the presence of the Italian Ministry for Equal Opportunities and Family. Uh, Minister Bonetti that will close uh, the, uh, the, the day with uh, the closing remarks of the event. And let me also thank uh, Pina Picerno, Vice President of the European Parliament, for uh, giving us her uh, thought on this important thing. So again, uh, I'm looking forward to, to listening to the next speakers and I really hope that you will spend a productive day and will get important information also for even yourself divulgate this crucial topic in the next uh, years. Thank you very much.
Well, it's a part of the time uh, adjusting ourselves to, to this kind of uh, approach. Um, so, um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm very glad to be here today. And I, I wish to thank the uh, director of Bocconi University, Gianmario Verona, uh, for his greetings. Um, as we said, uh, we are honored to have with us uh, the Minister of Equal Opportunity and Family, Elena Bonetti, who is going to join us later on. And I want to thank also the French Council, uh, uh, François Reverdeau, uh, for being with us today. But my thanks goes also to all the distinguished guests from uh, the most renowned uh, university in Europe, institutions and companies. Uh, um, welcome to Bocconi University students, and uh, welcome to AXA colleagues and the partners, uh, and all the other people who are joining uh, physically and digitally today for this event. And it's brilliant to have uh, such a diverse audience today. Um, briefly, there is a three reflection I would like to share with you today. The first one, women are a vital force for positive social change. International and uh, European institutions target the gender equality as a key for building a peaceful community, economic growth and social progress. And that's why by supporting uh, the rights of women and girls, all humanity is moving forward. That's why we are committed, extremely committed, to empowering the woman to thrive and to live a better and healthier life. In 2021, our CEO, Thomas Buberl, financed a new initiative on health, um, which was uh, targeting really the access to health care to underserved population, with a strong focus uh, to women specific gender uh, condition and health condition like uh, the one of maternal health. As an insurer, AXA has an important role to play in order to build and support the building of society from a resilience as well as inclusive standpoint. Is a part of our purpose, we act for human progress by protecting what matters. And that's what we live in every single day of our business, but is also deeply anchored in our culture of inclusivity, diversity, and care. The second thought I would like to share with you is that we are here today because we share a vision that wants to move the world forward. And we want to really realize a society where every individual is recognized as equal. If we act together, we can really drive a cultural change and also prompt the decision making. And that's why we have been creating the AXA Research uh, Lab with uh, Professor Paola Profeta and, uh, and the Bocconi and the AXA Research Fund to join effort and investment and in making sure that we could uh, raise knowledge and awareness on what is the gender challenge and making sure that also society will embrace this challenge. I think I spoke about uh, raising awareness as well as uh, knowledge. I think uh, the third thought I would like to share with you is that education is probably the strongest keystone. I think we are doing uh, a lot of progress, but there is a long way to go. I think uh, setting quotas and uh, making investment is important. However, I conceive that breaking the bias and changing the daily habit is what really is going to make the difference. The real innovation might be creating and living an environment and working in an environment where every individual feels respected and uh, empowered. And that's why my invitation to all of you is really embrace a strong call on the issue of gender equality and making sure that we can bring uh, uh, the progress on this matter as an opportunity for human progress. I'm going to conclude with a personal note. In the 60s, my mother was one of the few um, pediatricians in the south of Italy. She succeeded in a man's world. From this university, which is 
stands for liberalism, pluralism, economic and social progress. What I wish for the youth today is that everyone can really realize her or his own ambition in an equal world. Thanks for listening, and I'm now going to introduce the Vice President of European Parliament, uh, uh, Pina Picerno. Thanks again for being here. Dear Rector, dear professors, it is a pleasure to take part in this panel about gender equality, and I am sorry not to be there with you all, but we are in Strasbourg for the plenary session of the European Parliament. I have been working for many years in the Committee on Gender Equality, and as you know, gender equality is one of the fundamental values of the European Union. For this reason, the European Parliament is strongly committed against all forms of discrimination and it always works in order to accomplish gender equality in all sectors. Last year, for example, we addressed the topic of education and employment of women in the so-called STEM sectors. We called on the European Commission and on the Member States to take concrete measures for the promotion of uh, gender equality in the STEM sectors. For example, by investing in education action and lifelong learning and by promoting positive models for girls. In a similar way, we addressed the digital gender gaps. I believe that uh, these sectors will be the most important in the job market in the future and if we do not act now, we will lose the possibility of gender equality in many fields that do not even yet exist. That do not even yet exist. More generally, we need to guarantee economic independence. In my work, I always stress the importance of economic independence for women. And I am totally convinced that guaranteeing such independence is key to reach gender equality in all sectors. In this sense, we need to take into consideration both female employees and employers by fighting against discrimination at all levels, by ensuring gender balance in economic decision making at the top uh, levels. We also need to take into account reality. Women shoulder most of the unpaid work, especially in the care economy. Therefore, we also need to develop resilient childcare services and schools in order to allow all parents to maintain paid jobs. Whether one likes it or not, reality shows us that when one of the parents needs to leave their job in order to take care of a relative, it is the woman who does it. So, during the negotiations for the next generation EU, we made sure that this aspect will be taken into account. If you go and read the regulation on recovery, you will find a whole recital about the impact of the pandemic on women. We were almost the first to uh, want against the so-called shadow pandemic, namely the aggravation of all the pre-exist gender gaps. Therefore, we called for investments that guarantee economic empowerment on women, underlying how this will also have a positive effect on gross domestic product. And we fought very hard to include gender equality in the criteria for the national recovery plans, so that if a state did not include specific measures, this could be judged negatively by the Commission. For example, the uh, Italian recovery plan commits billions of euros to promote gender equality. 
but I think that apart from, uh, from the numbers, so we should note that the pandemic was a transformative moment or for, for our societies. At last, nobody denies the importance of gender equality anymore. And all institutions, both at the, Euro at the European and the national levels, finally understood what we have, have always said. The gender equality is key for the welfare of all, for the future of our economies and for the future of Europe. Thank you very much to all of you. Okay, so now it's time to present some research. So um, I am the first speaker. I'm going to present some research that we are developing at the lab, at the XR Research Lab on Gender Equality. And in particular, Today we will concentrate on the impact of women, uh, of COVID-19 of COVID and the pandemic on women and gender equality. So let me start from the idea of this cheese session. This has been circulated a lot during the last years. And basically during the pandemic, the question, one of the main questions around our research was whether women are more affected than men by the pandemic on the labor market. So I'm going to talk in particular about Italy. Of course, many of the arguments that I raised will be also tackled by my colleagues after. So they are not specific on Italy. But if we look at Italy, uh, we know that uh, uh, in terms of sectors of activity, 84% of female employment is in the service sector, and the service sector is the one which has been hit stronger by the pandemic. So this is somehow different from the previous recessions, from the previous crisis. They were mainly a man sessions, where the sectors particularly hit were uh, sectors where most of the workers are, uh, ma are men. And in addition, the closures and lockdown have affected women's activities. A lot of activities, for example, tourism, restaurants, care, these are sectors dominated by women. So this has put additional pressure on a female labor market. In the longer period, the gap in employment has stabilized thanks to different measures that different countries, including Italy, have put, for, have put forward. For example, income support, retention schemes, and employment benefits. But still, we have uh, this uh, very important problem in our country here, which is that female employment rate is uh, 49%. So less than one out of two women work in Italy. And this is a date, this is a number which does not refer to the COVID period. It was like that even before. So uh, this is an emergency. This is really uh, a very strong emergency for our country because um, it's uh, one of the last countries in Europe, with the only exception of Malta and uh, Greece. So the second aspect related uh, to the she session is what happened within the family. So overall, women are the main providers of informal care for children and the elderly. And this is true not only in Italy, even in other countries, but particularly strong in Italy, at least for two main reasons. One of this is the stereotypical gender norms. And at the lab, we are doing research for measuring the impact of stereotypes on gender norms. This is a research in progress with Alda Marchese, Maddalena Ronchi, and Lorenzo Spadavecchia. And we are trying to measure the stereotypes because this happened to be true not only uh, in the general population, but also among uh, people who are supposed to be less stereotyped. For example, managers and people who are in charge of decision-making positions. And the second reason is inadequate formal care provisions. We know that uh, only 25% of places uh, in formal child care are given to uh, children between zero and three years old on average in the country. So for these two reasons, together with other uh, aspects, the care, the, the informal care for children has typically uh, been um, very strong within the family, and in particular on women. 
So uh, with the pandemic and with the lockdown measures, this has been stronger than before. We also know that more equal sharing at home reduces gender gaps in the labor market. This is also research that we have conducted at the lab. And we know that family responsibilities during the pandemic have increased. So together with the sectors of activities which were hit by the pandemic, this means that we have a very big challenge for gender equality due to the pandemic. So I put here two main hypotheses, let's say, in theoretical terms, at least from the economic and social point of view, and then we are going to see with the data uh, which of them prevail. So there are mainly two uh, hypotheses. First of all, with the lockdown and the new organization of work, we know that all of us, we have been requested to work at home, to work at distance, and this obviously has helped the opportunity to work because this was the only way during the, um, the lockdown. So uh, what happens with the, uh, with the new organization of work and with the lockdown? There are two possibilities. On one side, men are more exposed to family and care duties because they also work at distance, mainly uh, at home. And this may induce less traditional gender roles because this may induce also men to be more involved in sharing activities and care, in particular household and child care activities. So in the long Round, this probably is going to uh, reduce also the gender gaps. We have conducted some research on what is commonly called the smart working, uh, and uh, the smart working has this uh, potential outcome, um, which is to increase men's involvement in household and care activities. So there is a study that we have uh, uh, recently um, finished with uh, Marta Angelici, uh, where we uh, prove and we show that there is more involvement of men in care activities uh, during the smart working working period. But on the other side, it may also happen that due to stereotypes and the lack of childcare that we mentioned before, and due to, uh, in particular, to a very traditional uh, division of labor within the family, men are even less involved than before. So responsibilities increased, but men are less involved. So um, women are more involved than men. So on at the end, probably the, the care gap remains. And so the gender gaps risk to be exacerbated. So probably we don't have a final answer today, of course, to this trade-off. There are short-term effects versus long-term effects. We all hope that in the long run, this new way of working will prevail. And so the idea that uh, this uh, less traditional gender norms will be the, the, new, the new rule, this will, uh, will have some impact also on the gender gaps. But for the moment, probably the, uh, the answer is uh, not the positive one. And actually, at the end, it's a kind of an empirical question, which we have addressed in a, uh, in a, in a study performed at the lab, where we basically have um, followed uh, Italian working women, a sample, a representative sample of Italian working women during the pandemic, during two waves of the pandemic. And from this data, obviously you find the reference. So if you are interested in more details of the study here today, I just want to give you a short introduction, but you can read the papers. So um, the idea of this study is that basically what happened during the pandemic was that it is true that not only women but also men increased the time they spend in housework, childcare, and distance learning. But women increase this much more than men. So at the end, you have in this graph the number of hours spent in housework, childcare, and distance learning by women and by their partners before the COVID, during the first wave, and during the second wave. And you see pretty clearly that there is an increase, because there was an increase of family responsibilities during the pandemic, both for men and for women. So it is true that men are more involved, and thus, is supposed to be good for gender equality, but much more for women. So for the, at the moment, the gender gaps are not really closing. Actually, they have increased a little bit. There is also the, the trend of coming back to the previous time after the end uh, of the second wave of the pandemic, but we are not able uh, at the moment to say a final word on this. 
Second piece of evidence uh, is related to the policies. The policies uh, were not gender neutral, although in principle they, uh, they could be somehow. I mean, they were meant to be gender neutral. So for example, if we look at school closures, we find that this has been particularly important for gender equality. And in a paper, in a research in progress by uh, our uh, researcher, Silvia Griselda, with other co-authors at Bocconi, they have, uh, find, they have found that in countries with lower female participation to the labor market, for example, Italy is one of that, governments have closed schools longer, which means that the policies may also exacerbate the gender gaps that we already observed before the pandemic. A second type of evidence related to the policies is the one that uh, is related to parental leaves. And uh, parental leaves were introduced during the pandemic, and we also know that they were mainly requested by women. So they were not equally shared, although the policy per se is gender neutral. So they could be requested by both men and women, but what happened is that mainly ma women requested. And uh, we know this also from another research that uh, we are conducting at, uh, um, at the lab with uh, Jimena Calò and uh, Letizia Mengarini. And finally, uh, the least piece, let's say, in terms of policy is related to labor market. When we talk about labor market policies and we talk about labor market and the pandemic, we all only talk, we only, uh, let's say, we always think about smart working and flexibility and work flexibility. This is not the only part of the story. There are also many other policies and many other aspects which are important in terms of labor market. For example, Italy introduced tax relief for women employed, but also in general the environment at work was much more difficult, for example, for women. So we will also have some long-term consequences, for example, if remaining, uh, if the attachment to the labor market changes because it's more difficult to change jobs, to, to look for another job, to look for another position in times of crisis, in times of the pandemic. And for example, we have this prediction by a research in progress by uh, Caroline uh, Coley, who is also a researcher uh, at the lab, that uh, the probability for women to remain in an environment, uh, even when they are uh, somehow toxic environments, so not very friendly with respect to women, may increase because of the period, because of the uh, difficulties during the pandemic in looking for a new job. And this may limit the progress achieved so far, for example, after uh, the Me Too movement or other uh, type of cultural changes that our companies have experienced. So somehow uh, we, are, uh, we risk losing part of the improvements that we have experienced so far in the labor market. In terms of perceptions, agreement, and compliance, this is another chapter where we have found crucial gender differences. And I am mentioning this because we want to move from what we have called the she session to somehow the she recovery. So what women can do for uh, recovering after the pandemic. So we have done a big uh, research, a large project with, uh, with other researchers. And um, basically here we, uh, we have built together a very large data set where we ask men and women about their perceptions, their agreement, their compliance with the rule during the pandemic. And that was pretty strong. The difference between women, men and women were very strong. Women are more likely than men to see COVID-19 as a very serious health problem from the beginning of the pandemic until very recent because this is a study that we have performed in different waves. Women agree more than men with restrictive measures, and they are also more compliant. They have been more compliant during the whole period of the, uh, of the pandemic of, uh, of COVID-19. So the question becomes whether those different attitudes of men and women that we have documented and measured in this, uh, uh, in this paper, which was uh, uh, recently published, these different attitudes are predictive a more effective response, for example, by women leaders. And I have just a, few, a couple of uh, uh, information, let's say for you, just a couple of uh, uh, graphs to share. One is this one. In this graph, you see on the left the, um, the behavior somehow in terms of policies of women leaders during the pandemic with respect to school, to school closure. 
And actually here, uh, the um, zero means uh, no measures, one means uh, some type of closure, two uh, a little bit more, and three it means really uh, closing all levels. And you see pretty clearly that male and female-led governments behave very differently in, in the sense that women tended to be uh, associated with less closure than men. And this, of course, has implications in terms of gender equality because it has implication on the family relationships, on the way work is organized at home, and therefore, as we know, on women more than on men. On the, on the, on the right-hand panel, I present this similar evidence, but the index here is, uh, is not school closure, but it's uh, male versus female-led governments. And again, in terms of uh, income support index, and again, it seems that income support was, much, uh, was promoted much, much more by uh, women than by men. So they tended to behave a little bit different, and this is also why we need, somehow we always talk in our research about gender balance in decision-making position. The last piece of evidence that I would like to share with you today is this one. So uh, um, this is a research in progress uh, with, uh, uh, with Giulia Savio, again, at the researcher at the, uh, at the uh, AXAR Research Lab at Bocconi University. And here, I mean, the, the graph looks a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, not particularly um, easy to follow, but uh, I'm, uh, I will explain in a second. Here uh, I show data about Italy, again, and about small municipalities in Italy, so municipalities with less than 5,000 residents, where we expect there is a kind of close link between uh, the decision makers, so the policy makers, and, um, and uh, uh, the citizens. And actually, uh, zero, the zero margin, so what you see here in the graph as zero, basically we have uh, the um, we have municipalities that uh, experienced a close race between a man and a woman that were uh, running for uh, for a major uh, position. Okay, so that was uh, uh, before the pandemic. So basically, on the right of the zero, we have uh, the municipalities that randomly, so by chance, because they ended up with a, a very close race um, won by a woman, uh, had a, a female mayor running, uh, uh, let's say, deciding during the, uh, during the COVID. And on the left of the zero, you have uh, municipalities uh, which were run by a male mayor. But they are quite similar in the sense that they really happen to be by very small uh, margin, that the man versus the woman won the elections. So what I find here is that this very simple, this very simple difference makes a big difference in terms of the expenditure with respect to um, with respect to social policies. So on the right, so municipalities that happened to have a female mayor in 2020 because they ended up with a small, uh, with a, a close race uh, uh, gender mixed, electoral race before, spent much more than the other in terms of social policies. So there may be a difference also in how we plan to uh, recover after the pandemic. So in terms of decision making positions, and here the contribution of women will also be particularly relevant. So decision-making positions, gender balance in terms of male and female imply also a more balanced view of what are the priorities and what is the agenda and how we can uh, recover after the pandemic. So uh, thank you very much. And, um, and now uh, I, uh, I'm going to introduce our second uh, um, uh, researcher, second spe academic uh, um, speaker today, who is uh, connected remotely, uh, Libertad uh, Gonzalez, who is professor of uh, economics at uh, Pompeo Fabra University. Thank you, Libertad. Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you very much, Paola, for the kind invitation to participate in today's event. Um, and uh, so Paola requested that I talk a little bit about what we have learned about um, 
women and COVID-19, looking at data for Spain. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a picture of what I've, you know, what I've learned from studying uh, data surrounding COVID and, and women. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on, um, on the labor market. So I'm, uh, as Paula said, I'm an associate professor of economics at uh, Pompeu Fabra University and the Barcelona School of Economics. And let me now share my slides and show you what I wanted to, uh, to. Okay, so I'm going to tell you uh, first a little bit about the, um, about the initial uh, shock to the labor market that took place in 2020 with, uh, you know, with the um, start of the pandemic. And then I'll tell you a bit more about the recovery since the spring of 2020. And as I said, I'm going to focus on labor market effects. Uh, so first, I'm going to show you what happened in Spain in the spring of 2020. So uh, the 2020 lockdown and the restrictions to economic activity, um, of course, led to large drops in employment in Spain as in many other countries. I'm going to show you how those um, employment effects were concentrated in certain sectors. You will see that many of the themes and results that I'm going to discuss will be you know, to some extent similar to the ones that Paula presented for Italy, perhaps unsurprisingly. So I will show you that the employment effects of the pandemic were concentrated in certain sectors. And those sectors had a higher uh, presence of women compared to the sectors that were more affected in previous recessions, thus leading to, you know, this, this, uh, these terms of, uh, you know, from a man's session back in 2008 to the current uh, she session. So I'll tell you the extent to which uh, this was the case in, in Spain. And then I will highlight the role of uh, three different features that uh, Paula also highlighted, you know, who that features that were different across countries. So I will tell you, you know, what, what was the case in, in Spain. The first one of these features is going to be uh, related to public policy and in particular to the role of furloughs. Uh, in Spain, as in many other European countries, uh, the government uh, introduced a furlough scheme such that workers, so, such that firms could um, keep workers on the payroll while the workers were actually not working or working fewer hours. Um, but this um, this uh, setup allowed workers to to still make 70% of their earnings, essentially uh, paid by the government. So this uh, you know th this scheme uh, limited the drops in employment and household income during 2020. Second, um, I will mention the role of school closures in the particular case of Spain. And Spain was actually one of the countries where school closures were were shorter. So schools were only closed essentially for three months from March to June of 2020. And this, I think, played an important role in understanding what happened uh, in the labor market. And then I will also show you some data about, um, you know, uh, working from home, which as we know has been more prevalent since 2020. And I mentioned the challenges and opportunities that come uh, from this increase in, in working from home. So that was back in 2020. What happened since then, and in particular in 2021? Uh, in Spain, as in other countries, employment levels had pretty much recovered by the end of 2021. Uh, for both men and women, and I will show you this. But these, uh, you know, this this recovery of employment levels came with some rearrangement across sectors, such that some sectors have shrunk since 2020, while other sectors have expanded. So it's interesting to think about, you know, uh, what kinds of sectors have increased, uh, which sectors have shrunk, and what's the presence of men and women in those two groups of sectors. Working from home has. Um, has become less common since 2020. So people have, uh, are mostly back to working outside, working from the office. Um, and as of today, furloughs are, are now marginal. So most people are back to work. So I will end by mentioning, um, you know, some thoughts about uh, what's coming, looking ahead. And essentially my conclusions will be that, you know, we still have the same problems as before. So, we, you know, women in Spain still have lower employment rates um, than men, lower earnings, and they still remain unequally uh, in charge of um, care work, informal care work. 
such that you know these problems have not really you know have not really improved with the pandemic. I'll also talk a bit about the new economy. So uh, you know the sectors that are becoming more um, that are creating more employment now um, suggest that we should uh, you know implement certain policies such that these new jobs can be taken by both men and women. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is, uh, let's um, think back about 2019. This was the uh, distribution of employment in Spain by sectors in 2019. So you can see that some of the bigger sectors in Spain were retail, manufacturing, the hospitality sector, so hotels and restaurants, and health and social services. So let me show you what happened in terms of employment across sectors since 2019 in Spain. In this figure, I'm showing you know, the larger sectors, uh, and there are two blue bars. The first one with like little squares shows the change, the percent change in employment across sectors between 2019 and 2020. So what happened to employment across the different sectors in 2020. And then the second, the solid blue bar shows the changes in employment from 2019 to 2021. So, you know, uh, putting these two post-pandemic years together. So what we can see here is that some sectors experienced uh, strong reductions in employment since uh, 2019. And the, the, sector that, the sector that suffered the most in, in terms of employment in Spain was the hospitality sector. So you can see here that uh, you know, this is, uh, again, hotels and, and restaurants mostly, so the, the tourism sector. Um, so you can see that since 2019, the total volume of employment in the sectors has, in the sector has dropped by almost 15%. Okay, so this is unsurprising. The second sector that has suffered the most in terms of employment is the sector of uh, household services. Okay. Uh, as I'll show you in a second, these two sectors that have suffered the, the most in terms of employment are relatively female-dominated sectors, in particular the household sector, but also hospitality. And then at the other end, we have, the, we have some sectors that have actually grown since 2019. So during the pandemic, they have created jobs. Uh, the, the sector that has created the most jobs in Spain was information and communications, creating more than 10, so increasing by more than 10 percent, followed by health and social services. Okay, so, you know, how are men and women distributed across these sectors that are growing and shrinking? Well, um, you know, uh, I'm showing here, so again, listing the sectors, and I'm showing you the share of women by sector in 2019. So, for example, in the household services sectors, sector, 88% of um, workers were women in 2019. And I just showed you that the household services sector experienced uh, an important employment decline since the start of the pandemic. So, this um, this sector, the decline in the sector has um, hurt female employment predominantly. However, the second sector that's more female dominated, the health and social services sector with 76% female employment was a growing sector, right? So from the previous graph, you remember that health and social services was one of the sectors that grew the most. Um, let's look now at the other end. So what were the sectors that were, so let me go back here. So. You know, hospitality was the sector that um, shrunk the most. Hospitality is a sector that's 54% women. So again, the reduction in employment would have hurt women disproportionately. And then in terms of the growing sectors, we have health and social services, but also information and communication. And as you may have guessed, information and communication is a male sector, only 31% of uh, women in this sector. So, you know, some of the growing sectors were female dominated, some of the um, shrinking sectors were female dominated. What happened overall? How did these changes translate into changes in employment rates for men and women since 2019? So this is kind of, uh, I guess, the main, the main result that I wanted to show you. These are employment rates for women and men um, in Spain since 2013 up until 2021. Uh, and you can see clearly here with the, with the dip in 2020, 
what the impact of the pandemic was for men and women. The top line is employment rates, so number of employed people over uh, population. And the second line is not counting workers who are in furlough as employed. That's why you see a stronger dip in the second line, because workers who are furloughed here are not counted as employed. What you can see here is, first of all, employment rates are consistently much higher for men than for women. They had been increasing since 2013 with the recovery from the previous recession. And then we see an important you know, drop in employment for both men and women in 2020 and you know, a relatively quick recovery since then. But most importantly, you actually see that the lines for men and women evolve uh, essentially in parallel. So we don't see that um, you know, the, the 2020 shock affected men and women very differently. This is shown even more clearly here where I'm showing changes in employment rates for men and women quarter by quarter since 2020 with respect to the same quarter of 2019. So here we see that in the second quarter of 2020, employment rates fell by about four percentage points for both men and women. Um, you know, if we, if, we, if we include furloughed workers as uh, unemployed, then this would be a drop of 17 percentage points. But you see that the, the drop was very, very similar for men and women. And then there's a very quick recovery of employment rates such that by the end of 2021, we are back to, um, to the same employment levels as in 2019. And the recovery, again, goes in parallel for men and women. So in the case of Spain, is this a, can this be called a she session? Well, compared to the previous one, of course, uh, the pandemic hit female sectors more than the 2008 recession, but overall, um, the pandemic has hit male and female employment very similar. What was affected um, differentially for men and women was the, actually the hours of unpaid work in particular, uh, hours spent by men and women in, in the household in terms of informal childcare or informal care of uh, other dependents, uh, relatives, and so on. So in this figure, I'm showing you weekly hours of childcare, uh, pre-COVID in the blue column and during the spring of 2020 for men and women. And what we see is that both men and women reported spending more time doing childcare during uh, you know, the lockdown period back in 2020. But for women, um, the increase meant that they had essentially a full-time job just doing childcare. And this is for men and women living in a couple and with children. So what really um, reacted or the, different, the main differential effect of um, COVID on men versus women was that women were actually working more as a result of the pandemic because they, you know, they were working the same as, or they were affected the same as men in the labor market, but they increased their hours of household work much more than men. So uh, essentially had this double shift during the pandemic. Women were also more likely than men to, to work from home during the pandemic. As you can see here, I'm showing you in pink, it's women, in blue, it's men who were a fraction of employed women and men who were working from home um, since 2020. Um, in the spring of 2020, almost 25% of women were working uh, from home, uh, a bit less of men. Of course, these numbers have been declining since then. Okay, so I'm almost out of time, so let me talk a little bit about the future. If we think back about the sectors that have been growing since the start of the pandemic, the growing sectors are information and communication, health and social services, professional, scientific and technical activities, and to some extent also education and energy. These are growing sectors. Um, the sectors that have been shrinking the most are household workers, household services, and hospitality. And both of these sectors are female dominated. Uh, so in terms of thinking about the future, um, you know, uh, we should probably keep in mind that uh, we're going to have to channel flows of workers from low-skilled sectors such as hospitality and household services to some of the higher skilled and growing sectors. So, you know, the new economy after COVID-19, it looks like it's going to be more skilled, more green and digital because of the 
growing and declining sectors. So just a few words in terms of policy recommendations. Uh, what I think we need to have in mind is the need for skill upgrading because of the, you know, uh, the sectors that are declining are sectors that uh, where most of the workforce uh, is um, has the lower levels of um, formal training and education, where while the new sectors are more skilled. We should also we should also think about continuing to promote uh, the presence of women in STEM, such that they can take advantage of the growing sectors in the digital economy, you know, information and communications. And then uh, going back to the main policies that affected the reaction of the Spanish labor market to the pandemic, I think in the case of Spain, uh, the fact that schools remained open throughout most of the pandemic was crucial to retain women in the labor market, or at least so that their participation rates wouldn't fall any any further. So I think this is something we should keep in mind uh, looking ahead. Uh, and in terms of um, additional policies, I think uh, policies that promote um, men's increased contributions to childcare, housework, uh, informal care are going to be crucial in promoting, uh, you know, women's attachment to to the labor force. And in terms of promoting flexible work, including working from home, I think any policies that we implement from now and going forward should keep in mind that should be, that we should be promoting flexible work among both women and men because otherwise these can be you know double edged sword type of policy uh, since we risk sending women back to the home while while men stay out of the workforce okay so thank you very much um, and i look forward to the next presentation The next presentation is by uh, thank you. by Almudena Sevilla, who is a professor of economics and public policy at uh, uh, UCL, University College London. Thank you, Paula, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me to this beautiful city. It's wonderful to be able to travel again. Um, Paola also asked me to, to talk a little bit about my research on COVID and the effects on, on women. So what I'm going to do today is to present several papers I've been working on um, on this topic and, and hopefully um, end up with some, some uh, topic for discussion. So um, this has already been mentioned. This time is different. Uh, COVID hit sectors uh, that are dominated by, by women. And um, it also uh, was a, a, um, a shock to the labor supply to, to workers uh, because schools closed. So somebody needed to do the childcare and the housework. Okay, so, so there were two different shocks in this pandemic. The, the labor demand from companies and sectors closing down and from a worker's point of view as their time demands at home increased. And I think it is important, um, and, um, and one of the speakers already mentioned, uh, that we go back to the basics of how we, why we care about gender equality uh, in an economy or from an economic uh, perspective. So, so I am an economist and I'm often asked, but what does gender have to do with economics? Um, so uh, there is a, an equity reason, a fairness reason, but everybody has different views about the world and what is fair and what is not. From an economic uh, perspective, uh, the reason why we care is from an efficiency uh, reason. If we are misallocating talent, in this case female talent, then we're not reaching the potential as an economy, we're not reaching the potential as a company, we're not reaching the potential uh, that we have as human beings. And, and there is now uh, more recognition within economics, um, mainstream economics, that uh, this is the case. And there is an interesting paper uh, showing with data from the US um, that um, that the increase in GDP that occurred over the last decades in, in the US is partly due to a great extent to a better allocation of talents to women 
and minorities enter the labor market. Okay, so, so this is an important issue. Um, so, when one of the first papers uh, that I started to work on, and partly it was because we didn't have um, survey data readily available. The only country that really had estimates on a monthly basis um, that were representative at the economy level was the US. Uh, our labor force surveys in, the, in, in Europe usually lacked with some months, so it was particularly difficult to do any research on uh, the European labor market while the pandemic was happening. That's why many of us um, decided to do our own surveys, like um, uh, Paola and, and Libertad has shown. Uh, but in the US, we have the, the current population survey, which is a monthly survey, and it continued to be collected. And uh, from that survey, uh, we know that whereas in February, men and women had the same labor force participation, the same number of jobs, uh, when uh, COVID started, and by December of that year, women had almost one million jobs uh, less. So this is um, a paper that I started during the pandemic and that we're still working on that looks at school closures. Uh, but here we just have the average of employment rates. So the red line are women, the blue line are men. Uh, the two vertical lines is the period of, of the pandemic um, that we're going to analyze in this paper. Uh, when the pandemic uh, hit in March, till the end of the school year, uh, June, okay? And, and we see the drop in employment that was much bigger for women. And as Libertas was saying, employment rates have converged. This is again only parents, so this is not the economy as a whole. This is parents in the US with children uh, between six and 12 years old, okay? Um, so, uh, yes, the, the, the labor force rates of men and women, parents in this case, have converged, but it doesn't mean that uh, women uh, were, were not hit uh, harder. And what we really want to disentangle in this paper uh, is whether these effects comes from sectors closing down that affected women more so than men, or it came from the additional household responsibilities that came through school closures. Um, okay, so that's ours. So, so this is a paper with Catalina Muedo, who is in San Diego, uh, and, and two Spanish um, professors, Miriam Marcen and Marina Morales, who is now at UCL with me. Um, and we use data from uh, the CPS between January 2019 and May 2020, and we look at working age uh, parents with children between six and 12 years old. And what we did was to collect school level uh, data at the district level. So in the US, it is the district, which is a smaller unit uh, than the state, certainly a smaller unit than a county. And, and we, um, we were able to, uh, to see whether certain districts had closed down their schools or not. And what we find when we uh, do the analysis is that in those states uh, or in those districts where schools uh, closed, even after controlling for the other policies, lockdowns or uh, closures of business, etc., uh, we find that work hours uh, were hit. So it wasn't necessarily employment. Employment was affected by business closures, but the school's uh, closures had, a, had an effect that were a little bit higher for women. And we actually look at the data now, and, and we've seen that employment levels and work hours levels have gone back to the levels of before the pandemic for this population, but it doesn't mean that uh, districts uh, that close the schools much earlier and for longer period, there is still this long-lasting effect even now. Okay, so... Um, as Paola and Libertad have already shown, a lot of the labor market responses, uh, different labor, mar labor market responses 
by, by women during this time uh, go back to what goes on in the family. And um, so here it was very, very hard to, to find data on household division of labor, on how much housework uh, or how much childcare uh, was really uh, being done at home. So we collected our own surveys and, and I actually have several papers uh, all looking at the UK, which is where I'm based now. The one that I'm going to talk to you about today is the one with the Institute of Fiscal Studies, a team from the Institute of Fiscal Study, where we actually collected a diary. So we asked our parents to tell us what they were doing every hour of the day. And uh, actually, the quality of the data was, was really good. It wasn't obvious how uh, you collect this type of data in, in, in a time like this and via online service. But, um, but we, this was one of the innovations uh, that uh, in time use research uh, has come out of, of the pandemic. This is a topic that I've been working on for a long, for a long time. Um, and um, here, a paper that I wrote in, back in 2010 with one of my PhD students, we looked at a lot of countries, a lot of OECD countries, and, and we look at this type of data to get a sense of how much time is spent in these activities. Um, and if we just look at housework, and again, these are individuals answering the diary every, you know, for 24 hours, they have to say what they do at every point in time or every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes of the day. Um, men spend about 12 hours per week doing housework activities and women spend about 28 hours. Childcare, uh, when we talk about primary childcare, is um, two hours for men and eight hours for women. Of course, women and men spend more time with their children, but they recognize it as being an active uh, sort of activity, active childcare uh, to an eight. So, I mean, the numbers were already uh, pretty, pretty stark. And um, so we collected data of about 5,000 parents, uh, during uh, the start of the pandemic, uh, May 2020, that's when we finished our data. And uh, what we asked here, uh, we asked them at every point in time, every hour of the day, they had to say what sort of activities they were doing. So they could be doing more than one activity. And you see here that um, during 10 hour slots of the day, women were doing some kind of childcare, it was also very high for men, about eight hours of the day they report to be engaging in, in childcare. And, and pay work hours obviously de decreased, um, but we see women doing half the amount of men. This is employed and unemployed, that's why the numbers are so small, but when you look at employed uh, men and women, it's, it's very similar. And what's interesting about this data is that it also gives us a sense of uh, the kind of activities people were working from home, right? So, so how were they managing uh, these activities while working from home? And uh, we see at the bottom end of this figure, we see that leisure, personal care, or sleep, um, they were doing, men and women were doing it at the same rate throughout the day. So, for example, leisure uh, was mainly done in the evening and sleep was mainly done at, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, right? So in the middle, people are not, not sleeping. Uh, and personal care uh, throughout the day. When we go to the top, what we see is that paid work, housework, and childcare were all being done at the same time uh, by men and women. And uh, of course, the darker green line indicates that men were doing more work, but their work was also being interrupted to some degree by, by housework and, and some childcare. Okay, so, so that's, that also has implications for how we think about um, about working from home when children are at home. And 
the, the latest sort of research um, that, um, that I've been looking at is, is the impact on, on well-being. So we asked individuals, this is another survey, but it's also for the UK, we asked individuals how satisfied they are with their lives. And we were asking them throughout the pandemic. Um, the dotted line are the measures that the UK government took. So the spikes that you see in May and in January are lockdowns. And, um, and when you see in the middle, it's kind of a relaxation of the social uh, social gathering rules. Um, the, uh, the orange line are men and the green line are women. And we see that well-being is very much related to this kind of social restrictions. Um, and, and going back to what uh, Paola, mentioned, Paola mentioned, it is true that women react to these restrictions in a different way. Their attitudes are different. Uh, what we are now trying to figure out is whether their behavior is also different uh, and, and also whether uh, these leisure activities uh, mean different things for men and women. Uh, we collected also information on, on how much they are enjoying these activities and it seems that whereas men and women declined the amount of leisure activities that they were doing, especially during the lockdown periods, um, women care more and, and get more, more enjoyment from, from leisure and socializing than, than do men, at least during, during COVID. So just to, um, just to uh, end uh, with the challenges ahead, so, so I gave you a picture of what happened uh, during the pandemic in terms of well-being, in terms of how we use our time, in the labor market, but also at home, the effect of the different policies, the school closures and, and lockdowns. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about where we go from here, where it seems that the, the end of the tunnel is finally uh, coming. Um, so I want to talk about remote uh, working and, and really challenge uh, some of the uh, simplistic views that, um, that seem to be uh, coming out, not just from uh, the private sector, also from the academic sector, uh, and, and to, and to um, spark a little bit of debate uh, for the round table that is coming next. So what we have, um, we're working, and this is actually, I just finished uh, looking at this data before coming here. So this is very preliminary. Um, and and this, is, this comes from um, financial analysts mainly. This is data from the members of the CFA, the Chartered Financial Analyst. So we collaborated with the CFA Institute, uh, and this was in the middle of the pandemic, so 2021. And um, we asked uh, a lot of questions around the structure of work. Okay, so, so we asked them about um, the percentage of work uh, that involved interaction with clients. We asked them about the percentage of work that was specialized versus more general uh, knowledge, the percentage of work uh, that was teamwork, uninterrupted uh, work, unpredictable workload and also work hours. So CFA was really interested about work hours increasing in this, uh, in this sector. And um, when we analyzed the data, we asked them before and after COVID. Uh, of, we asked them at one point in time and retrospectively what they thought work hours were before COVID and what hours are in, uh, currently in 2021. And so, for example, work hours, we see that about 80% of, of um, financial uh, workers um, report that they do more than 40 hours. So, so this is not surprising, 40 hours a week. Um, we go to interaction with clients. 29% uh, report that their work, so, so to, yeah, that their work requires at least 50% of interaction with clients. 
Um, and these things are very, all these uh, variables seem to be very stable with COVID. So it's not that the nature of the work changed in terms of their need to, to interact with clients, etc. But one, one of the uh, variables was remarkably uh, different. And this is the unpredictability of the workload that increases by 10 percentage points. So, um, so more workers, both men and women, now say that their work has become more unpredictable. And that is really a challenge if we think about uh, implementing remote working without really questioning the work structures uh, and the management styles in the workplace. Because remote working, if it increases the coordination among workers and if it increases uh, the cost to pass on information between, between workers, uh, then it becomes uh, very costly for workers, particularly for women, because uh, as we have seen in the data, women are the ones that need to be on call at home, and if they also need to be on call uh, while they are working, then that poses a lot of problems. Uh, for women in particular. So thinking about how we devise uh, new ways of thinking about work and how we manage workers and how we manage working from home uh, rather than simplistic rules about the two or three days at the office or at home, I think it's what's, um, what's really the next step. Um, so thank you very much. I leave it there. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I now would like to introduce uh, Dario Donato, who is going to uh, chair uh, the next part of the workshop. Dario Donato is a journalist, uh, media set. Thank and, you very much. Uh, he has Thank you, Professor. Guests. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a great honor, a pleasure to be here with you personally and virtually uh, with an outstanding speaker, speaker, director, professor, academics. Uh, managers. I'm going to introduce Antimo Perretta, uh, maybe he's already connected, he's the CEO of global, he's Europe and Latin America uh, of uh, uh, AXA. Uh, he will address with a speech about mental health. Mental health is very important and maybe has been and is also a, a side effect of what we experienced uh, with COVID. But let me take a, a sort of um, football assist uh, from Giacomo Gigantiello, the CEO of AXA Italia, was saying that his mother was a pediatrician and my partner is too, a neonatologist pediatrician here in Milan in, a, in an hospital. And uh, <clears throat> speaking about mental health, um, when the COVID-19, I shared this quick story, when the, the COVID-19 exploded in February, March 2020, uh, we had not the possibility of doing smart working. I'm a journalist and she's, she, she works at the hospital show. So she decided to make quite every day the night shift. Night shift means sleeping uh, every 48 hours because we, we had at that time uh, two kids, four years old and six years old. So it was February, March, I remember. And in uh, June, in June, after June, uh, she, she went directly to the, the, the psychologist. So I felt guilty, and remember men here, we are quite always guilty in family, but in that case, I, I, I really felt guilty for what happened. And so I realized that mental health is really an important issue. So please, Antimo Perretta, CEO uh, Europe and Latin America uh, of AXA, you here? Thank you very much for being here with us. Yes, I'm here, Daniel. So thanks, Dario. I hope um, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had uh, really an, an aspiring discussion until now. And thank you very much for inviting me here to be with you. I would have loved to be there in person, but unfortunately, my agenda doesn't allow it. I hope you had a good discussion, what I said, and you can take important insight with you today and this evening. So the evidence that our expert has provided us are key insights and we need to leverage as we recovered from the pandemic to ensure that we continue our progression towards gender equality. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has made several social economic inequalities. We saw this as well 
in our own research when we inquired into the state of mental health of population and uh, this for two years now. The recent Maximind Health study that we launched across 11,000 people shows that in many areas, women face more challenge to their mental health than men. And we have seen and heard that for our professor speakers uh, um, today. It's harder for women to flourish. The risk greater financial hardship have lower salary, are more often in insured employment, or they are unemployment, and they get less downtime. One striking result that we saw was that men manage their well-being better than women across the country. There are many reasons that contribute to this. One is that men are likely to shoulder more domestic responsibility than men, like homeschooling their children or taking care of older relatives. However, it's more often a question of finance. These issues excited before COVID-19, but it becomes worse with the lockdown and all the restriction that we that were imposed to protect our physical health. We see that this is often because women tend to have more financial concern than men and are more likely to be in an unstable or low paid jobs. With jobs, for example, if there is a decision to make, men typically earn more money on average so it would make more financial sense for the woman to stay at home with the kids. Therefore, it's a consequence of structural inequalities that existed before the pandemic. In this way, COVID-19 forced some women to assume roles more typical of early generations. I'm confident that together, we have made a lot of progress on gender equality over several years. However, the pandemic has been a setback. Whenever conditions become a bit harder, we are more likely to see inequalities increase again. AXA is committed to address this important issue. This is the second year of this study and reflects our commitment to address mental well-being. We have launched the AXA Mind Health Index in our study. The index will be repeated annually to build a moving picture of our global mental well-being. What I like about this index is that it makes us proactive. There are actions we can take to improve our situation an example through diet, sleep, and the, men, and the way that we connect with others. It is also identified factors affecting our mental well-being that we have little control over, such as the public healthcare system or the current pandemic. It will assist us, companies, healthcare professionals, and governments to monitor and act to improve mind health. AXA has the capacity and tools to have a major impact. Then when it comes to mind health, we believe in a holistic approach focused on being a positive force for human progress by providing information to empower people to identify and deal with problems even before the influence their mental well-being, because we all know prevention is really key. We want to advocate of this approach in the insurance industry. To promote prevention, for example, AXA is already encouraging our customers to maintain or start health habits. Offered in almost all countries where AXA is presented are new methods on delivering mental health services. For example, coaching 
telemental health, artificial intelligence-based platform, and wellness applications. Moving forward, I assure you that AXA will continue to be a force for change. To close my contribution today, there are three things that I would like to emphasize. First, for our customer and corporate clients, we offer good value and transparency, making sure that they have great experience when it comes to their health journey. Second, for our own employees, the priority is to have increased mental well-being in the workplace with a safe work environment and the provision of enough support and well-being services. You will hear more about this later during this event. And finally, the society. With the results of our study and the index, we intend to work closely with businesses, healthcare professionals, and policymakers in their approach to mind health. This will help continue the dialogue and promote well-being. Again, thank you for all the work you do here. Let's continue to be committed to driving progress in all the corners of the society. Let's ensure that we move forward together with positive actions being adopted from the policymakers to businesses to benefit all society. We need to work together to protect what matters. Thanks again for your attention and have a great event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Antimo Peretta you, for David. your insights and your speech. Thank you very much, Antimo. I go here on the stage with me, my brilliant speakers, Silvia Candiani, CEO of Microsoft Italy. Silvia, welcome. Kirsty Levers, Global Head of Culture, Inclusion, Diversity, AXA. Marina Mendes Tavares, economist from the United States International Monetary Fund. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here with me. And uh, with us is also uh, Ginetta Tzcona, she's connected from the United States, Research and Data Specialist, United Nations Women. Ginetta, are you there? I think it's quite early over there, so uh, thanks double, thanks double, Ginette. Is the audio okay? I asked to I can hear you all, oh, you can hear me. Hello yeah, everyone. Quite good, quite good. Thank Thank, thank you very much. Well, we will discuss also uh, of the impact of COVID-19 uh, with a study from the United Nations, uh, with a um, perspective of, of the labor market from the International Monetary Fund, and then with some uh, corporate aspects from AXA and uh, for sure uh, Microsoft Italy. So, uh, Jeanette, we've been telling last hour and a half that um, COVID-19, but in general, crises, they uh, are not gender neutral. Okay, so uh, what are your evidences in that sense? Thank you so much. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, so in response to your question, the impact of crises are never gender neutral. Uh, and unfortunately, COVID-19 is no exception. Women have been especially hurt by the resulting economic and social fallout of the crisis. Uh, new projections of global poverty by UN Women and Partners, for example, point to a significant rise in extreme poverty globally, with more women living um, on less than $1.90 a day than men. In 2020, women's employment fell by 4.2% globally, compared with 3% for men, so another concrete example. Uh, we see a similarly worsening situation in the area of food security globally, with women reporting more difficulties in this area. Broad measures of health and well-being have also seen a steep deterioration, including in terms of women's access to family planning services. Reports of violence against women and girls, what we call a shadow pandemic to COVID-19, also increased in many parts of the world. The COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID pandemic 
um, laid bare gender and other enduring fault lines of inequality. These are not new, uh, but definitely COVID-19 and other crises like it have, have, of course, made an impact and made things worse. Um, so to answer your question again, uh, unfortunately, no, they're not gender neutral, and therefore the policies and the responses from government and businesses uh, need to be gender sensitive to respond to these, to these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, Kirsty, um, we spoke also about the importance uh, of uh, smart working or hybrid model or remote working. Here in Italy, we used to, uh, to calling it uh, remote working and not smart working. Uh, but do you think it could be the, the solution of part of these issues? What's happening in AXA? It's a good question. I think it could be the solution or it could make things worse. <laughs> and this Even worse? Oh, for sure. Because somebody said earlier, at least more than once, all the problems were there already. Right now with the COVID crisis, we had a chance to break the way of working and now we rebuild it. And Giacomo said right at the beginning that it's about habits. And it's about the habits that each of us have every day and we have to rebuild with the right habits. So, yeah, I think you couldn't hear me, sorry. The, the, the moment right now is for each of us to take the right habit and build what will be really smart working, which will be different for me to it is for you, to my colleagues here. For me, it's quite impossible, unfortunately. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a way. <laughs> <laughs> we can angels. be creative. But, but smart can be the answer. And when I listen to all the challenges that we face, I'm quite confident to, to add a little bit of positivity because it has been some very challenging messages that right now we have the opportunity to build a workplace that could be much more equal, but we have to be deliberate and we have to think about how we do it. Almundi and I spoke earlier, Almundina, sorry, and she gave me the challenge of saying it's not so easy as just two or three days, and it's definitely not. Huh? I, actually, we made a global policy that everybody in the world has the opportunity to work remotely for two days. In AXA Italy, I know you're going further than that, and that's great. Offering people the flexibility to access the workplace is very important, but we can't do that in a way that creates a two-tier system where the men, and I characterise, but go to the office all day, every day, and the women work remotely, and we value one more than the other. So I think there's, I could talk for hours. I stopped for a minute, but there's definitely a strong opportunity to change the world, but it relies on every one of us, literally every one of us, changing our habits in the way that we can. Yeah, and what were you doing uh, now in AXA? You're, you're um, having an, an hybrid model. I mean, you're working, you're based in, in Paris. That's right. Not wrong. So, yeah. okay. You're working uh, at the office two days, three days, and at home uh, other two days. So, so what is I, your solution right now? Yeah, so we, uh, we're in 54 countries. Um, so that's a lot yeah. of employees in a lot of very different circumstances. You're more than 100,000. We are people. much so more you're, than you're quite a, an, an average city, Italian city. <laughs> That's right. So it's a, it's a large group of people. And as I said a moment ago, my work, smart working is not like yours. The situation in Italy is not the same as in Japan or in the UK or in the US. So every person, every team, every entity needs to find the way that works for the clients that they're serving because we serve many different kinds of clients, their team and themselves individually, and, and that order is quite important. Finding that right balance is not easy. Now, this is a big responsibility for managers, and we're doing a lot of work on the change on managers, on how we make the right model. Our basic premise is that every single employee, no matter which country, no matter which team, has the opportunity to work from home for two days a week. Of course, like with every rule, there are some exceptions, there are some jobs where you have to be in the office. But as far as possible, everybody has the opportunity, as well as everybody has the opportunity to come every day if that's what they need, because coming to the office can also be very important for some people. Yeah. Uh, Marina, uh, we spoke about uh, she, ses she Session is also the title of the conference today, and, and She Recovery, of sure. Uh, studying for this conference, I discovered that the 2008 crisis was a men's session because uh, it was more tied to financial sector, so men were more uh, involved. But this She Session is, a, is an evidence board with the COVID or even before? Yeah, so it's, it, now it's such okay. a common place to talk about she session. But actually, as you said, this term was born in, during the global financial crisis in 2008. And the main reason here, I think it's important to clarify, like for non-economists, that it, when we say main session or she session, it's not that 
uh, one gender is a fact and the other gender is not a fact. Both genders in the global financial crisis and nowadays are a fact. The employment has declined. The she section and men's section comes between the gap. So when the woman employment falls more than men, we call a she session. And when men employment falls more than women, we call a men's session. And in the global financial crisis, there was a big gap. And the gap was in favor for men because men work more in construction, uh, manufacturing, and the financial sector that was hit during global financial crisis. And now, the, as we spoke uh, before, this crisis is a crisis of the services sector, of contact-intensive sector, and women employment is much larger in this sector. And that's why it came out as she session. But I have to say, the she session became very popular right now. It was not so popular during the global financial crisis to make this distinction. Yeah. Uh, uh, Silvia Candiani, is, she's the CEO of uh, Microsoft uh, Italy. Uh, I spoke with her many times about the technology impact uh, uh, on the labor market, and we will discuss about that in a few minutes. But in general, uh, you deliver, as Microsoft, Microsoft every, every year, an index, uh, the way we work. So what, what were the last, latest evidence in, in, in this sense this, this year? Maybe the yeah. last one is 2021. Yes, mm -hmm. it's called the um, Work Trend Index, mm -hmm. and in fact it measures across uh, all the countries uh, how we work, and actually some of the um, things that we, we talked about are really represented there, such as uh, the increase in the number of hours that people work, um, uh, and uh, the, the, of course the, the rise of the remote working, uh, uh, which is not always smart, uh, like in, uh, during the pandemic. Just in Italy, um, the number of remote workers went from uh, 500,000 to uh, almost 10 million in the matter of a few months, so a big change uh, in the way we work. Um, but I do agree on the fact that uh, this needs to be sort of a, a restart of how we work. In a sense, it's an opportunity for a hybrid way of, way of working, as uh, Christy was saying. Um, and we see that about 70% of the employees say that they want to continue to have some sort of smart working. 70%. 76. Ah, 76. So, yeah, so they expect this. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, a lot of them want also to come back to the office for, to get the reconnection with, uh, with the colleagues, the, uh, the rest of the employees. And so some of the things that we see is that uh, it's very personal. So um, again, uh, more than 50% of the people say that they can concentrate more um, at home, for example, to do some kind of, uh, um, you know, a presentation, some, something that requires a concentration. Uh, but at the same time, 50% say that they can do that better in the office. So really, it's uh, about our personal preferences and the way we do that. So the point is that uh, we put we didn't put any rules on how to come back to the office. We have 100% freedom of organizing yourself at home or in the office. But we do expect to have some sort of contract between the manager and the team to decide how a certain team is going to manage the situation because there are customers to serve, there are you know, teams to build. So um, we need to have, let's say, a team charter, how, how to work mm -hmm. and how to do it effectively. And I think that as a rule of thumb, in fact, uh, people uh, spend about 50% of the time in the office and 50% at home. Um, and I think we need to get better in both ways. So to really leverage the time in the office, not just to come to the office and sit in front of your PC, but to do um, you know, the, the team meetings, to do the co-working, the um, co-creation, the creative part, and also become much more um, productive when we are you know, in a hybrid environment with some people at home um, to really become, to make them feel included because if, uh, back to your point, if everybody, if you have a citizen A, employee <laughs> cluster A who sits in the office or close to the boss and kind of more appreciating than get the reward at the <laughs> promotion time and then <laughs> employee B that stay home and can take care of the kids doing smart working three things in parallel, it's not a good, um, it's not a good system. So I think there is a lot of, uh, I mean, we've measured also the increase in productivity during the um, smart working is up to almost 20%, so it's massive. The loss Short, of productivity? No, increased increase. productivity. Increase. Ah, okay. Short-term meetings, no connection uh, yeah. to... Um, no, no blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no coffee exactly, machine. Yeah. But at the same time, the, the problem More is... More kids um, and less coffee <laughs> machine. 
It's a problem is the loss of a sense of uh, belonging also to the organization, sense of purpose. So it's very important to work on balancing those things yeah, but out. I, I, I get a curiosity in this sense. When you, Silvia Candiani, when you try to hire a, a student from, for example, Bocconi University, how is important uh, right now, today, to offer a hybrid model more than maybe a, a wage? It's very important. Uh, it's one of the first few questions. So they want to understand a, the company mission, so, you know, what am I going to join? Do you have some sort of a bigger goal? But second, it's very important also uh, how flexible you're going to be. And uh, it's, I mean, it's true for all the generations that, so it's not more about men and women. Um, but uh, so for the young, it's very, very important. But now, say, it's very much uh, uh, cross uh, gender, age, uh, it's a requirement. Clear. Um, Jeanette, are you there? Uh, we, um, as United Nations, you as United Nations, uh, have some sustainable goals at uh, 2030, right? right? That were assessed even before the pandemic. So the, the, what was the impact of the pandemic? The pandemic maybe is slowing uh, the process or not? Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. Um, so I'm um, happy to provide kind of that global perspective. It's good to hear the other speakers who are providing kind of the, the, the business perspective, but you're absolutely right. Um, with the Sustainable Development Goals, the idea was that we would be monitoring and promoting gender equality um, in all of our work. Um, and here I'm talking, when I say we, I'm talking about governments, I'm talking about business, I'm talking about individual students who are sitting in the audience with you today. Uh, we committed collectively to achieve gender equality by 2030. Uh, and the pandemic unfortunately has stopped progress um, and in some cases reversed hard won progress in, in this area. We did a full assessment um, this year of the status of Goal 5 on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so that is the, the goal on gender equality and found really what I can only say is, is a depressing state of affairs. Uh, the world is not on track to achieve gender equality by 2030. Uh, the distance remaining to achieve the goal is very long and the time is very short, right? Um, 2030 really is around the corner. In two areas critical to women's empowerment, um, time spent on unpaid care and domestic work, and here the goal is to um, have parity um, in this issue so that men and women equally um, take on the responsibility of, of caring for children and for the next generation. Um, and in many countries, we still feel and find uh, that more can be done to ensure that women have access uh, full access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, and in these two critical areas, we see that uh, countries actually are far from where they need to be in terms of full equality and rights. Um, in other areas, uh, for example, eliminating discriminatory laws uh, and ending harmful practices like child marriage, uh, progress has been moderate, we've seen progress, uh, but moderate progress is, is deeply insufficient if we're to achieve the goal by, by 2030. And unfortunately, uh, with respect to child marriage, for example, we are seeing some increases there um, as a result of COVID-19. As it stands today, over a quarter of the indicators that we use to assess progress on gender equality are far or very far from target. Over a third are at a moderate distance from target. 24% um, are, are close, um, so you know the story isn't completely bleak. 13% uh, are kind of at target or almost there. But again, you know we need to be doing more if we're serious um, as a collective um, in that goal of achieving uh, full parity and full equality by 2030. Uh, so, so, so yes, again, sorry that the story isn't uh, rosier, but, um, but we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and it's great to hear that, you know, in terms of, you know, what I'm hearing from the other panelists, that uh, businesses are taking very concrete steps to, uh, to address these issues uh, within their own spaces. Uh, and we need to be doing more of that. Um, one of the things that I think uh, comes out very clearly from the data is that the inequality that we see in terms of inequality within the home uh, translates to inequality outside of the home in terms of opportunities for, um, for um, paid work, for advancements in careers, et cetera. Um, so really, you know, in, in, it's not just kind of changing, you know, our, our working methods, right, and promoting kind of hybrid models, but how do we make sure that 
both men and women are taking advantage of that. So we avoid the scenario that was raised earlier, right, where women are only taking, uh, you know, advantage of these of these new uh, policies, uh, and therefore you know, in, inadvertently uh, being disadvantaged even further. Uh, so we really need to change mindsets, not only the way we work, and and do that together to promote more equality across the board. Again, in in within the home, outside of the home, in government, in society, in businesses. Um, it really needs to be kind of an effort that uh, transcends across all areas of, 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 uh, of society and, and of, of life, right, of daily life. Uh, Jeanette, if you, if you, I continue with you. If you could choose, what would you choose um, from policymaker uh, to do uh, trying to reverse this trend? I mean, more childcare facilities, for example, the smart working uh, hybrid model we were telling about some few minutes ago. What would you choose? Yeah. Forefront women's empowerment really make that the center of uh, the work that we're doing uh, in the years ahead. Uh, where women thrive, societies thrive. Um, and by the same token, where women are denied equal rights opp and opportunities, society and the societal goals that we have for ourselves uh, struggle and they don't advance. Um, companies can, can be doing a lot, and we heard about uh, um, some of those examples in terms of um, flexible working hours, flexible locations, but also promoting uh, some of these uh, policies that we know uh, make a difference, right? So increase uh, maternity benefits, uh, parental leave, allow people to have access to emergency leave, right? We realized during COVID-19 that Caring responsibilities are not just about caring for, for young children, but also caring for elderly, elderly relatives, et cetera. And so making sure that people can have a better, more balanced life in terms of, you know, um, you know, dividing their time between, you know, the work that they're doing um, outside of the home and the work that needs to happen inside the home uh, for a, a healthy, thriving society. Um, you know, in many countries, what we've been advocating is, uh, of course, um, related to uh, reforming laws. Um, uh, removing discriminatory laws, oftentimes which prevent women from working in certain uh, sectors. Um, another area that I'd like to highlight, and I, maybe I'm out of time, but just very quickly, you know, one of the other areas that is a quick win, um, and um, since we're speaking to, to business leaders here uh, today, I think, you know, promoting um, transparency in terms of, um, you know, transparency in terms of wages, making sure that uh, information about how much women are making, how much men are making is open and available to all so that we address some of these long you're, uh, standing you're, you're, inequalities. You're speaking about wages, transparency in, in this sense. Yes. Ah. Because we, we, we always here in Italy, we got a, a, an issue about privacy, you know? So it's quite unusual to know how your colleague uh, earns or something like that. So <laughs> it's quite weird to hear from you. It seems that it, it comes from another planet. Uh, we <laughs> always have the, the, this kind of problem here in Italy with transparency, with, with privacy, sorry, not transparency. Ma, uh, Ma, Marina I would like to add something to your discussion. Yeah, no, no so I, I just want to add, I want to make two points here. One, I think it's very important to understand, you know, we are in Italy, we are in Europe, but what we observe in the IMF on a global sense is that we observe a divergence with respect to secessions. We see that in advanced economies, secessions like during the peak of the lockdown periods were uh, a global, a big phenomenon, and women employment declined more than men. But as was present in the case of Spain, UK, and in even Italy, women are back to the workforce, they're back to work. Labor market here is quite tight and there is a pressure for workers to come back. But in emerging markets and low-income countries, this is not the case. We observe this same gap, but women stay out of the labor force. So there the situation is a little bit different because we need to bring them back, right? And when How to do that? It's quite difficult in emerging markets, I mean, because maybe they have less means, less possibilities right. to enter the market. Yes. So investments? 
for example? Yes, so we needed to do investment in education, in opportunity, yeah. because there, is still a, there are two gaps in investment in education, right? One is about what type of jobs you choose, if women should be in STEM, should be in professionals that are very competitive. And another one for countries that are, have le lower level of development, you also need to bring girls to school and they stay in school. And for that, family, and family planning and women's health is important. And it's also too important to remember that in, during the lockdown measure is that these are essential services that were forgotten sometimes. Women were suffering violence during lockdowns. So they didn't have a safe place to stay. And that's also, I think it goes on the Paola point. That's been that, an issue, even in Italy. Yes, that because many times women are, women are not part of the decision making so the services that are chosen as essentials are services that are chosen with a man lenses. And services that are essential for women, for example, safe space, family planning during lockdown. It's still, when you're pregnant, you need to go to the hospital. So uh, OBG needs to be working. We're not part and we're not planned. And we're not going to be able to achieve that without the equal participation in in the private sector, as having more women as CEOs, and in policy making as well, more participation in parliaments and in, in decision making at all. But, and, but I think maybe this is also a, um, a problem of culture, no? The family decision making. I mean, for example, in my case, as I, as I told before, it was my was not my decision, but was pushed by me to to bring my my partner to do the night shift quite every day because we had no possibilities of doing something something else because we had no vaccines, so no grandparents, no nannies, nothing, and so uh, in other cases. In other case, maybe it's a question of culture. What do you think? So I, I see here two issues. One is the issue of the care economy. Again, the right? care economy. We are, what do you what do you what do you experience and what we are experiencing in many countries is a lack of care economy, right? And if you don't have a care economy in a place to a kid to stay, someone needs to spend hours with the children, right? And most of them is women that do that. And the second part is on this division of labor inside of the household and the fact that, that the women are more likely to spend more hours at home, that we need to fix it. And this can be fixed, I will not say fixed, but can be supported through education and to increase awareness. And, and I think the lockdown period, I think, is one of the, uh, one of the bright sides is that because men had to do more housework, we were expecting that they would continue to do. And when they come back, we would see yes. a higher share. But it's not, and the data doesn't indicate that this is a privilege. Um, <laughs> maybe at the end, I, I know that the, the, the minister, Elena Bonetti of Equal Opportunities, maybe she's already listening to, to us, and maybe she will remark on, on that aspect of data, of policies, care policies, and care uh, economy. Uh, but, um, Kirsty, do you think that there's a sort of risk of a, a kind of U-turn, uh, an inversion in the labor market in models? I'm speaking about, I'm saying models. Uh, so coming back from the hybrid model to the normal office one day. Because, for example, I, I read today on the Italian newspaper that the emergency status will finish, that's clear, on, at the end of March. And that brings, brings the fact that the, uh, on the public administration they will come back to the office the whole uh, workforce. I mean. Absolutely. I think we've been through a difficult phase right now, but I think the next phase from a workforce point of view could be even more difficult because now we make choices that will affect probably the next 50 years of the way that we work. Now, this is the closest thing to the industrial revolution that we will experience. Now, we rewrite our working model right now. So there are three possibilities. One is we just go right back to how it was before and, and we're just so relieved to be back in the workplace that, that, that we create something that it was before. The second is that we accidentally create something worse, uh, that we really make those two tiers by, by letting people maybe make the choices based on their gender rather than, rather than the job. 
And the third one is that we recreate a workplace that is much more equal, that gives access to opportunities of employment to a broader range of people. How to do that? Well, very deliberately to start with. So I think it's a mistake to imagine, and, and I come back to the point of simplicity, it's a mistake to imagine that we say two days in office, three days out, or the opposite, or, or all everything in. We have to test, we have to try, we have to talk, we have to collaborate. We have to find the way that works. And, and I give a small example that was mentioned before, but I found it extremely important. Men need to take advantage of the benefits that are being offered right now as well. It's not just for women to take parental leave or to take flex time. I believe that men would also enjoy that, to spend more time Absolutely. with their family. Yeah, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but maybe in the past it's been difficult to do that. But now, you know, you guys, you have to be brave enough to also take those advantages. And by doing that, not only do you benefit, but society benefits, women benefit. And I was also really pleased to hear that even though we're in a corporate world, you and I, that the policies we put in place really do affect the outside world, and I believe it. Huh? So I believe that what we create in a corporate world influences society. And so the decisions that we make right now, we need to make sure that we pe keep people connected. We heard Auntie Mo earlier talk about mental health. There's a big risk to mental health with this change, like with any change. So we need to take care of mental health. We need to make sure that people come back to a workplace where they feel safe, that they can have some options and flexibility and control, and then that together we can develop a workplace that benefits being together, but also has that flexibility that invites the broadest range of people to come and work for us. But I think in general, Silvia, that uh, technology is an enabler of inclusion, both for women and men. What do you think? And what's your experience in Microsoft? Well, I do believe so, uh, especially because uh, it allows uh, more flexibility, which is uh, uh, one of, it was already before the pandemic, it was one of the main criteria that women were asking for on, in the workplace to uh, manage their lifetime better, um, uh, work and life. Uh, but I, I think that this is also proved uh, to us during the last uh, couple of years, you know, we could have not even worked if we didn't have uh, the support of, uh, of uh, technology. Uh, but I think now, back to uh, um, Christie's point, we are in a moment where we can redesign the way we work. So mm -hmm. we have the tools, it's about changing the habits and changing you know, really the, the way we work. And uh, um, I really think managers have a big role to play because, for example, they need to make sure that uh, um, when there is a meeting that is uh, partly in person, partly uh, remote, uh, that, you know, everybody has a chance to to talk and to contribute so that there is not the, the uh, you know class a and class b of uh, employees um, but then also data can uh, can help in uh, um, supporting managers to make the right calls for example now it's possible to have a visibility of all of the people that work in a team at an aggregate level for uh, privacy reasons but to see how they are collaborating how they are spending their time internal external what kind of activities is there a burnout risk because because maybe they're working too much over time, because uh, we see... Yeah, because when you are at home, you have no pauses. Huh? Uh, I mean, uh, you are always connected. Exactly, no? and I think that's a, that's a problem, right? That's so a risk, that's a risk. It's a risk because that's we see the correlation also with the burnout uh, 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 risk. And so uh, it's important for people to take uh, care of themselves and so to have some, let's say, alerts like we have with the watches that tell, you know, stand up and do some exercise. The same, I take a break and, uh, you know, to leave some time off for, you know, disconnecting. But also it's, uh, you can get the data through, um, uh, for example, through our system to see how your, your teams are performing, you know, is there a burnout risk in the team A versus team B and how do you coach managers uh, to, uh, to, um, to have their teams to be at their best? Because maybe in the, the old world you'd walk in the office and have a look around and understand what's, a, you know, the, the sentiment of the people. Now with a lot of people, uh, you know, working from home, you don't have this kind of pulse check uh, at the coffee, uh, a coffee break, so you need to be intentional how you connect, how you plan your time, how uh, and technology can help you to be, you know, to be your uh, supporter and get, giving you more insights and more tools to, to make it right. Yeah, and you have uh, your platform Teams that helps a lot and we <laughs> use it. We, use it. we uh, love it, uh, yes. <laughs> Ed Media said, I, I have to run with the schedule because I, I think that uh, the, the minister, uh, she's waiting. Um, but Jeanette, um, 
I think um, that we should try to look at the brighter side of the story, if there is a, a brighter side, a brighter side, uh, because after the pandemic, uh, uh, until two weeks ago, maybe we thought now it's quite over, and then the threat of a nuclear war, nuclear explosion, everything came. So it, it's quite difficult to find a, a bright side, but maybe from your perspective, the United Nations perspective, you. Uh, you can have a, an insight on that. Jeanette. Yes, no, thank you. Can I quickly touch on a few things that, that uh, were discussed and, and I'd love to then go into this bright side uh, question. Um, I wanted to bring us back to something that um, was raised earlier, right? How do we um, uh, address kind of the inequalities that we see in the workplace um, when potentially, you know, uh, people are just used to doing different things in a different way and, and really requires a kind of a, a cultural shift, right? So one of the things I think uh, you were saying was that even in your own kind of family, right, you had to talk to your partner and, and think about, you know, what made sense when you didn't have the grandparents and you didn't have, you know, uh, the nanny and other kind of, you know, um, support that you like. <laughs> you had nothing. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I wanted to raise is that, you know, many families went through this uh, challenge, yes, right? Yes. And, and women, many women decided to stay home, not so much because uh, of cultural reasons, I would say, but really because of the policies and, and kind of the inequalities that were already baked into to those decisions, right? So if the husband made more money, uh, if he was higher, you know, and more advanced in his career trajectory, uh, people make decisions, logical decisions. Does it make sense for me to stay home if I make less money, uh, et cetera, than, than you? Uh, and they're making an economic decision. So I wanted to make sure that we're clear that um, inequalities uh, that are already baked in in terms of, you know, um, equal, you know, or uh, unequal pay, uh, inequalities in terms of women's, you know, access to higher levels of, of position, uh, management position in the workplace. All of these contribute to inequalities that we see within the home in terms of that division of, of care responsibilities. And so let's make sure that we're linking the two and not diversing, diver, divorcing them because I think they, they really uh, are connected and linked. Yeah. Uh, to go to your question about the bright side. Yeah, the bright um, side. The bright side. We are <laughs> curious about side, the bright the side. side. Uh, because unfortunately, I did start with really quite a negative outlook. But I think visibility... I think gender-based inequality is, is not a new challenge, uh, but these challenges are finally getting attention, uh, particularly from folks who, who typically would not be interested in gender equality. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted uh, the importance of doing things better and doing them differently. You know, let's talk about wage transparency, even if we haven't talked about it in, uh, before, and even if it sounds very foreign and scary and, and potentially, you know, uh, something that, that um, you know, is not seen as, as right for us. Let's really think about these issues as, as concrete ways to address some of these challenges. And I think people are open in a way that they haven't been uh, in the past. Um, governments and, and businesses, for example, are for the first time in many countries, in many contexts, thinking quite seriously about uh, the challenges faced by working parents uh, and how to support women and all caregivers, right? Um, you know, fathers as well in the workplace. Um, access to affordable and quality childcare, more inclusive and adequate paid leave provisions, including parental, sick, emergency, and long-term care. These are things that really, uh, for the first time, are on the table in many countries where they hadn't been until now. In other sticky areas, um, as I said, in terms of you know uh, issues related to to the pay gap. Uh, governments and, and businesses are taking proactive measures. You know, I mentioned the the, the transparency law yes. uh, that came from yes. a, a particular example that we, you know, we we conducted a uh, a dialogue with parliamentarians last year, and that came from an example from Ireland saying, "This is what we're trying. We'll see if it works." You know, but we're looking for uh, innovative ways to change the status quo. Um, and I think you know something that you would have heard from all of your panelists today, right? You need to be intentional. You need to be planful. Uh, you need to be deliberative, deliberative in terms of what you're trying to achieve uh, and make gender equality kind of front and center um, moving forward. And I think that in, in itself, in itself is, is a bright side uh, to what, you know, overall is, is quite a, a challenging picture. Thank you for your thoughts, um, uh, Jeanette. Uh, I think, Marina, uh, that maybe we have technology as a, as a push toward the, the equality, but we experienced in the last two years how important is it education 
for building equal opportunities between men, women, students, guys, and, and kids, for example. Right, yeah, I think education was, it, it is very important. And, uh, and uh, in, I would do it again. in advanced economies, we know that already in many countries and even in emerging markets economies, girls are already more educated than boys, right? And that's also, I think, uh, coming back uh, to a presentation early, is that uh, you have this stock of girls that are super educated, that go to college, uh, do all this investment in human capital, and then, for example, as Paola was showing, in labor force participation is just 49 percent. Yes. So, so in Italy. We, yeah, in Italy. It, so we. It, it's you, few. It's a little. Very little. So we are missing a stock of productivity of humans that are going to create so much and generate output. You know. So it's, we are missing really. Uh, a potential that is just uh, that we can achieve by just bringing these workers that are already prepared to the labor force to work. And what I would like to say is that now is a very important time. We see that labor market uh, uh, is very tight. I think the, here my panelists can talk about that. It's hard to find talent right now because vacancies are growing very fast. We came out from this crisis, I think, stronger than we expect, like before when COVID hit. And uh, we need to bring more talent. And if the talent is... It's quite been... impossible to hire someone, some, some student from uh, Bocconi University, for example. There's a struggle <laughs> between AXA, Microsoft, and, and everyone here. In <laughs> so, yeah, so that's why it's important to bring the, the girls that are already prepared to that. Of course, it is also important to help them to go to areas where there is higher uh, payout, like STEMs. No, I think that's very yeah. important for Microsoft and AXA to bring their to write so educated then when they're in high school to think about a career that is more broad and understand the trade-offs of different subjects and in countries that are a little bit less developed we still need for example to provide sometimes support for families to keep girls in secondary education clean bathroom like like basic infrastructure is also super important and, and I think with these two things together, one recipe for advanced economies and one recipe for emerging markets economy, education can help close this gender gap that is super safe. Um, even with you, Silvia Candiani, CEO of Microsoft Italy, your conclusion. So um, the password for trying to solve this situation is studying the STEM disciplines scientific disciplines. We've, uh, we also discussed about that uh, maybe two years ago on television. So, uh, uh, do you think it's always the same, STEM disciplines? I definitely think it's always uh, the same and um, it's probably not enough, let's say, but I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, back to what Marina was saying, I mean, uh, um, STEM prepares for um, more um, jobs that are in high demand and in sectors that are, um, you know, we giving more opportunities to um, to women to rise faster and to have uh, better paid jobs and to have more career opportunities so um, we see uh, back to uh, your point uh, a big gap in um, in uh, or let's say middle alignment between uh, demand and supply of uh, the labor force and uh, just in Italy, we have about 150,000 jobs that cannot be covered because there are, not there are not enough people with the right uh, profile. And at the same time, we have 30% uh, unemployment rate for kids, yes. for youth, right? And a high unemployment rate in general. So it's just a waste of uh, the talents in the population that I know I'm much. So uh, for sure, we need to work to get, them, in general, more people on the STEM and specifically more women, because uh, those are the areas where there are lots of opportunities. And if uh, women opt out from the beginning because they think they might, it might not be interesting or they might not be good enough to do math, then uh, they miss out of a complete uh, you know, a train that is going to take them to, to maybe catch up, actually, in terms of uh, opportunities. So, STEM is an opportunity. It's not enough because, as I said, uh, um, just uh, the number of uh, um, uh, students that are coming out from, from these universities is not enough. So there is a lot of reskilling uh, or, um, you know, uh, uh, additional uh, 
a STEM type of training that the people can take on top in order to reconvert and to be able to adopt the, the job market. But also, at the same time, um, I found it very interesting to understand why women were not choosing, or girls were not choosing STEM. Right? Why? And we did a long study it's of still uh, like 15, that. 16. It's still like that? It's still like that. It's, uh, you know, around 20% of the students in STEM are women, and uh, it's not going up. <laughs> it's all the it's same. Not so I think it has a, a lot to be about uh, uh, orientation and really to get you know role models and uh, to understand that it's not about nerds but it's about you know maybe changing the world and doing some some kind of uh, cool stuff in uh, I don't know sustainability or in uh, you know data um, data modeling and all yeah, sort of things and, and to and see the impact that the STEM studies can have in taking the right decisions and being in, at the heart of, uh, you know, the, the business. Uh, so this is a big topic, but then in general, uh, I think it's also important to find ways to um, to uh, get companies more committed into, you know, creating the career path for women, to, um, to uh, create uh, equal opportunities for, you know, uh, equal uh, merit and to really help the, uh, the, the, the girls to express the potential that they have. At the same time, then there are all the services that are important, you know, childcare, I mean, design infrastructure, it's basic, but it's needed otherwise, you know, all the rest gets worse. And I add that maybe we need policies, and I'm going to discuss with the minister your conclusion, Kirsty. How do you, how do you see the future uh, in your company, in AXA? How are you contributing to redesign? your spaces, your workforce? Oh, it's a big change. It's a change that was coming. And we had already started experiments on quite a large scale of people working remotely. But it would have taken us probably, oh, if I'm up to, maybe us five years, but in general it would have taken maybe more than 20 to get to where we are now. We've had a break. Uh, this is proven that we can work remotely. It's proven. Uh, now we have to do that in a sustainable way. So we need to make sure that a situation that wasn't really hybrid, uh, this was people in a crisis situation at home, often with their children. The future when we talk about hybrid is not children at home. This is being able to work genuinely from home. So I think that in terms of creating the culture, developing the culture, it's a bright outlook. It's the time, it's the time to create the new world of work. We've been given an opportunity with this break. Huh? This is, doesn't come along very often. The whole world of work got broken for two years. Now we rebuild it, and we rebuild it in a way that's equitable and fair. That's what we're going to do. It'll take time. Clear. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be on the stage with them, my outstanding speakers. Ginetta Tscona, thank you very much, Ginette. Bye-bye, Silvia Candiani, Kirsty Levers, and Marina Mendes uh, Tavares. Now it's time, it's time for the closing remarks by Minister of Equal Opportunities and Family, um, Elena Bonetti. Is she there already? Do you yes, hear me? I'm here. I can hear you. Thank you very much, Minister. Your so your closing remark, and thank you very much uh, for being here with okay. us. It's really, really a great honor. It is uh, my honor, and uh, let me, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation. I am really honored to be here, so thank you to the Magnifica Rector and all the colleagues and the participants to this important occasion. Thank you to the University of Bocconi, and in particular, a special friend, a thank to my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Paola Profeta, for inviting me today to conclude uh, this very productive and inter interesting conference. Uh, it has been a time to reflect and discuss and to find new directions, new Minister, challenges. Minister, I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, maybe you got some issues with your camera. You should open your camera because we are not seeing you. I hope it's only this, this issue. Uh, okay, if, I do not know why, because I, I can see me in the picture, or, and I can see you, but you, can you hear me? Otherwise, I, I can Yeah, yeah they are, disconnect Okay, let's go. Let, let, no know. worries, no worries. Let's continue. The, okay, okay here, here we are. Here we are, okay. here we are. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Minister. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, so 
Let's, okay. do, this, let's do this again. <laughs> okay, I, I, I continue with yes. uh, my, yes, continue, my speech. And uh, really, let me say that uh, uh, this afternoon has been a time to reflect and uh, discuss uh, and to find new directions, new challenges, new strategies towards our main aim to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment in all sectors of our societies. During the discussion, we had the chance to recall how many and which have been the negative effects that the pandemic has caused to women's life in every aspect, both family and professional life. But uh, we are all aware that pandemic didn't create inequalities. And now it is clear these inequalities, gender inequalities, are the main obstacles not only for the complete achievement of women's empowerment but for the development of the whole society. We cannot build back better and to plan an inclusive, resilient and sustainable development without the contribution of women. Thus, it is really urgent to release women's talent, energies and capabilities to contribute to lead our future. It is a great opportunity for recovery and growth. More than ever before, gender equality has become a priority issue at the core of national and international policies. But it is also clear that we must promote structured and comprehensive actions, looking at a solid long-term development horizon. A strategy, a global agenda made by vision method and concrete actions. This has been at the heart of the first G20 conference on women's empowerment in 2021 during the Italian presidency. All the countries share the same commitment to develop, to develop a coordinated response to a global level to promote the role of women in society and women's empowerment, especially in light of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Addressing these challenges and achieving full equality requires a global agenda, addressing all the aspects of women's life with a cross-cutting and systemic policies. Such a transformative and global agenda requires then a high degree of multilateral coordination to be fostered by effective agreements at both national and international levels. The Italian government continues to do its part in the process of transition and transformation of the post-pandemic era, in the process we today called Chicago, not only at the international level, but also on a national one. The Italian Domani Plan, approved as a part of the next generation EU, has recognized gender equality as a priority including measures to support employment, female entrepreneurship, and parenthood. The Italian path towards equality also includes the reform of the Family Act, a law proposal that uh, I have submitted to organize family policies on several levels, starting from women's employment, educational services, sharing of care loads, and work like banner. This is a crucial point, as it has been highlighted just in the previous roundtable. Furthermore, Italy can finally count on a national, the first national strategy for gender equality, to provide an integrated approach to the promotion of equal opportunities and to prepare the country to face the challenges of the times to come. The strategy provides for the creation of a more equitable world of work in terms of equal career opportunities, competitiveness and flexibility, through support for female participation, in particular by helping parents to reconcile life and career, and by stimulating female entrepreneurship, especially in the innovative fields. Regarding skills, the promotion of which is essential for the enhancement of female talent, the strategy aims to ensure equal opportunities in the development of skills and the application of individual talents in all disciplines, and in particular in STEM disciplines, primarily by removing cultural barriers and gender stereotypes. 
All these actions are paving the way for a new future. Our vision is clear, making Italy, making Europe, making our international community a place where people of all genders, ages and backgrounds have the same opportunities for personal and professional development and growth, for access to education and employment with no inequality in terms of income or dignity, and can release their potential knowing the equality is guaranteed with no compromise in a modern country that is ready to face the challenges ahead. Together, institutions, universities, companies, civil society, we can achieve this goal. And so we can and we must succeed. And I'm sure that uh, we will do. Thank you so very much for this interesting discussion and also for once again inviting me to conclude at the conference. Thank you very much, Minister. It's been really an honor to have you here for the closing remarks. Thank you. This applause is for you. Thank you to Minister Elena Bonetti. So really, we are at the very end of this nice discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bocconi University uh, Director, Paola Profeta, Professor Giacomo Gigantiello, and everyone who took part to this, this uh, discussion. And thank you. Thank you to all of you. See you soon.